Uh, we have a variety of questions from the audience. Let me read out a few of them. Um, uh, about three sets of questions I will try to present to you. Um, first set, is there a chance that the democracy in the USA is going to turn into an oligarchy? That's one question, and I'd like to uh, read out this one, accompanied with the previous. One of the logical possibilities behind the 9-11 attack is that directly or indirectly the Bush uh, clan is behind it. After all, they benefited most from it. Um, the establishment media ignores this issue. Um, this is the usual conspiracy theory. Do you have any evidence, pro or contra, or do you know of any evidence? Um, another set of questions. But, well, I mean, I'll forget. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, I'll forget. Them. Thank you. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let me start with the second one and go back to the first one. The first one's more complicated. Uh, the second one, um, whether the, first of all, uh, did the Bush administration gain from September 11th? Answer, yes. Does that tell you anything? No. Uh, every authoritarian system in the world gained from September 11th, and it was immediately predictable. I mean, I remember my first interviews with journalists a couple hours afterwards. The first question I was asked is, you know, about this. And I said, look, every power system in the world is cheering. Uh, the Russians love it. Uh, it's giving them an excuse to increase their atrocities in Chechnya under the pretext that they're defending themselves under from terror. The Chinese love it. They're going to step up their atrocities in Western China against the Uyghurs, uh, claiming its defense against terror. Uh, Indonesia loves that they're going to go on a rampage in Aceh and massacre everyone because they have to defend themselves against terror. Uh, Ariel Sharon will you know, go wild in the occupied territories because we have to protect ourselves from terror. And so it continues. In fact, uh, just about every country, uh, I mean, the more violent ones just extended their own violence, but the less violent ones, uh, say like England or United States or France, immediately imposed the, what they called Protection Against Terrorism Acts of one kind or another, which had almost nothing to do with terror, but a lot to do with disciplining their own populations. So if you take a look around the world, just the more, what are called the more democratic societies, instituted mechanisms of control of their population under the pretext of defending themselves against terror. So, and this was completely predictable. I mean, this happens after, in, you know, even after an earthquake, things like this happen. Uh, power systems will exploit it to expand uh, their own power over their primary enemies, which are their domestic enemies, their own population. Uh, and if, if they happen to be carrying out violent repression, they'll ex ex extend it. So the fact that the Bush administration gained from it, although true, that doesn't seem to tell you anything. It uh, just says they're just one of the power systems in the world, so they gained from uh, Did they plan it in any way or know anything about it? Uh, this seems to me extremely unlikely. I mean, for one thing, they would have had been insane to try anything like that. Uh, first, if, if they had, it's almost certain that it would have leaked. You know, it's a very poor system. Secrets are very hard to keep. So something would have leaked out, very likely, and if it had, they'd all have been before firing squads, and that'd be the end of the Republican Party forever. You know? And to take a chance on that, uh, just uh, even if you could control what would... Further, it was completely unpredictable what was going to happen. I mean, you couldn't predict that the plane would actually hit the World Trade Center. I mean, it happened that it did, but you know, could easily have missed. Uh, the, uh, so uh, so it's, you, you could hardly control it. But what you could be almost certain of is that any hint of a plan would have leaked uh, and would have just destroyed them. And to take a chance on something like that would be meaningless. Now, if you look at the, there's a there's a big industry in the United States, on the left as well. I mean, you should see the email that I get. There's a huge internet industry from the left uh, trying to demonstrate, and there's books coming out, there were bestsellers in France uh, and so on, uh, that this was all faked and it was planned by the Bush administration and so on. If you look at the evidence, uh, anybody who knows anything about the sciences 
would instantly discount that evidence. I mean, there's plenty of coincidences and unexplained phenomena, and you know, why did this happen and why didn't that happen and so on. But if you look at a controlled scientific experiment, the same thing is true. I mean, when somebody carries out a controlled scientific experiment at the best laboratories, uh, at the end, there are lots of things that are unexplained, and there are funny coincidences and this and that. If you want to get a sense of it, take a look at the letters columns in the technical scientific journals, you know, so like Nature or Science or something. The letters are commonly about unexplained properties of reports of technical experiments carried out under controlled conditions, which are just going to leave a lot of things unexplained. That's the way the world is. Now, when you take a, a natural event, you know, not something that's controlled, I mean, you know, most of it will be unexplained. Uh, there'll be all sorts of uh, things that happened and that, you know, you can af afterwards you can put them into some kind of pattern, but beforehand you can't. Uh, the, and the pattern may be completely meaningless, because you put them into some other pattern too, if you want. I mean, that's just the way complicated events are. Uh, uh, so the evidence that's been produced, in my opinion, is essentially worthless. Uh, and the uh, belief that it could have been done is so, in, you know, uh, has such low credibility that I, I don't really think it's serious. I should say that, you know, I'm pretty isolated on this in, in, in the West. I mean, the, a large part of the left completely disagrees on this and has all kind of elaborate conspiracy theories and, you know, about how it happened and why it happened and so on. But I think they're just, uh, first of all, I, I think it's completely wrong, but also I think it's diverting people away from serious issues. I mean, it just, it just doesn't make any... I mean, even if we're true, which is extremely unlikely, who cares? You know, I mean, it doesn't have any significance. Uh, but it's, 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 it's a little bit like the... Uh, huge energy that's put out on trying to figure out who killed John F. Kennedy. I mean, yeah, who knows? And, and who cares? You know? I mean, plenty of people get killed all the time. Why does it matter that one of them happened to be John F. Kennedy? Uh, if there was some reason to believe that there was a high-level conspiracy, it might be interesting. Uh, but the evidence against that is just overwhelming. Uh, and after that, it's just a man, you know, if it happened to be a jealous husband or the mafia or someone else, uh, what difference does it make? It's just taking energy away from serious issues on the ones that don't matter. Uh, and I think the same is true here. It's my personal opinion. Uh, the uh, question of whether the United States has become an oligarchy is actually the wrong question uh, because it presupposes that it was once a democracy, but it wasn't. Uh, in fact, if you look at the... Uh, it's not even claimed to be. I mean, that's just public propaganda. Uh, but if you look at sort of you know, political science literature, people who try to be more or less serious about politics, it's not even called a democracy. It's, uh, a, the technical term that's used for it is a polyarchy. A uh, polyarchy is a system of elite control and public ratification. So the job of the public in a polyarchy is to show up every couple of years and push a button uh, and choose among a small group of, a small leadership group from essentially the same class and background and uh, interest, and then the public's supposed to go home and buy shoes or something like that, but not involve themselves in public affairs. It's the job of the leadership, the responsible men, as they call themselves, uh, to make the decisions. Uh, that's the way the country was set up. So if, again, you go back to the Constitutional Convention, uh, James Madison, the main framer of the Constitution, was very explicit about it. He said, we have to set up a system in which uh, power is in the hands of what he called the wealth of the nation. Uh, the uh, men who have, only men of course, the men who have uh, sympathy for the rights of property owners and who understand that the goal of government is to protect the minority of the opulent against the majority. I'm quoting, actually. Those are all quotes from... You, you don't read that when you go to school, you know. But if you go back to the Constitutional Convention, where they were 
talking openly. You know, that was the idea. And the political system was set up to have that result. I and mean, that's why there's so much power in the Senate. The Senate was the wealth of the nation uh, and only elected occasionally every six years. And that's why there's so much power in the presidency as compared with parliamentary systems. Uh, and the, the effort to break the rest up into sort of factions and separate them and so on was part of a way of ensuring this. Well, as I said, this has been a struggle ever since. I mean, popular groups don't like it, so there's constant struggles to bring more democracy and constant efforts to repress them. And that's just, that's the whole of American history, you know, and it goes in cycles, you know. There are gains, there's repression, and so on. Uh, we happen to be in the middle of a very repressive cycle. It's reflecting what happened in the 1960s. In the 1960s, there was a tremendous wave of democratization. Uh, lots of people just became engaged in the public arena and organized. Uh, women, uh, young people, uh, you know, farmers, uh, everyone. It was a period of enormous activism and engagement. Uh, that's one of the reasons why it has such a negative image. So if you read about the 1960s or you study about it in school, you're taught that it was a terrible time. It was called the time of troubles. You know, everything was horrible. Well, it was. It was, it was a move towards a popular engagement in democracy. And that had to be repressed. And there's been, a, there's been a, this is all over the world. It's not just in the United States. It's the same in Europe, same in Asia. Uh, same in, the, in the, the former colonies where, been, you know, where um, uh, resistance movements were developing, liberation movements. It looked like the world was falling out of control. And since then, there's been a large-scale wave of repression on every front. It's, some of it's ideological, uh, some of it is in the international economy, the neoliberal mechanism, so-called. Uh, their main role is to try to constrain democracy. I mean, they have an have a economic effect, too, mostly harmful. Uh, but uh, the most important aspect of them is they're directed against the threat of democracy. And that's happening internal to the United States as well in many different ways. And again, there's resistance. Uh, the, organiz or, you know, the activism that's going on, which is substantial, is a resistance to this. But there is no question about the United States becoming an oligarchy. It's, it was designed that way. It's never been that different. In fact, you can just take a look at the election that's coming up in, uh, in next November. Take a look at it. Uh, the, the two candidates, they were both born into backgrounds of substantial wealth and political power. They both went to the same elite university. Uh, they both joined the same secret society in that university. It's Skull and Bone Society, which is to train rich kids into how to be rulers of the world, to get the right social attitudes, and so on and so forth. They're able to run in the election because they're funded by the same institutions, you know, the same uh, financial and other corporate institutions fund them, so therefore they, they're able to run. Uh, and we call that an election. You know? I mean, it's not, you know, I mean, they had elections in the old Communist Party, too. You know, they did. You know, they picked different people to run it. And this is an extremely narrow system. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of propaganda They're trying to tell people, particularly people, say, in Eastern Europe, uh, that this is some kind of democracy. Uh, well, yeah, it is some kind of democracy, but uh, not political democracy. I mean, in many respects, it's a very free country. There's a lot of very good things about it. So the power of the state to coerce and control people happens to be very limited unusually so, I think, unique in the world. And that's a good thing. Uh, and there are other many good things, but political democracy is not one of them. Uh, it's got to be created. You know. I mean, in many respects, the U.S. is what's sometimes called a failed state, a state with formal democratic institutions, but they don't function. And uh, you can see that on policy issues all over the place. I mean, I if you want, I can give you plenty of examples, but on major policy issues, crucial ones, which everyone regards as crucial, 
public opinion and elite opinion are completely different. And the result is that those issues simply do not appear in the political arena and are not discussed in the media and are, people don't know much about them and, uh, and they have their feelings but they can't turn into uh, uh, political issues because it's just not the way the country runs. Uh, if you look at the elections, uh, elections, uh, the United States has an extremely powerful uh, propaganda system, by far the most advanced in the world. I mean, the Russians, uh, Germans tried to copy it, but they couldn't even come close in sophistication. It's called the public relations industry, which was created in the free countries. It was created in England and the United States for very good reasons. Uh, in England and the United States, about a century ago, elite groups began came to understand that they are not going to be able to control their populations by force. Uh, too much freedom has been won. So the capacity to control people by force had declined, and the only alternative is to control attitudes and beliefs. So they developed these huge industries, uh, massive industries, to control attitudes and beliefs. And it just <coughs> dominates the society. I mean, about uh, probably $2 trillion a year in the United States is spent just on what's called marketing. Uh, marketing is just propaganda. You know, it's ways to try to induce you to uh, devote your life and energy to something that'll keep you away from bothering people in power. And consumerism, uh, going into debt, uh, whatever it may be, just don't bother us. You know, uh, that's marketing. Uh, and uh, it's a, an immense industry in the United States, England, by now it's spread to much of the rest of the world, but uh, concentrated in the freer countries. Uh, these are modes of control. And, well, one of the things the public relations industry does is run the elections. So elections are run by the public relations industry. A candidate, first of all, the, the financing of elections uh, comes from overwhelmingly from the corporate sector. Uh, the, the, obviously, they have the money, they're going to finance it. Uh, elections, uh, since Kennedy, are mostly on television. That's it. That's the way of trapping people. But the public relations industry, which basically runs them, uh, has an ideology. They're pretty straightforward. I mean, I'll tell you about it. The ideology is to keep away from issues and to concentrate on what are called qualities. So the way you present a candidate is not, here's what I think about this or that issue but you can trust me, or I'm a leader, or you know, I'm the kind of person you'd like to meet in a bar and have a drink with, or something <laughs> like this. If you look at the, uh, at the campaigns, that's the way they're presented. Uh, you have to keep away from issues, because most of the public disagrees on issues, uh, and you don't want to get people involved in issues anyway, it's not your business. Uh, so what you do is present uh, people as uh, you create characters. I mean, the uh, people who run for office, are, they come, kind of come out of central casting. You know, they're trained to speak and talk in certain ways. And, uh, I mean, take this whole business about Bush being a religious maniac. Uh, maybe he is, I don't know. He could be about as religious as I am, for all I know. But everyone knows in the United States that about 40% of the population are religious fanatics. And I mean fanatics, you know, kind of like the most extreme Islamic fundamentalists. Uh, over half the population in the United States uh, literally believes that the world was created 6,000 years ago. And about 40% are what are called evangelical Christians. They've had a born-again experience, you know, saw Christ, it's going to save them, and this and that. Well, that's a huge voting block. And if you can pretend to be religious, uh, you can try to gain support of that. If you notice, every candidate in the United States on either party, ever since Carter, started with Carter, but ever since then, every single candidate has to at least pretend to be a religious fanatic. You know, well, it's partly to pick up that voting block. So like, say, Bill Clinton, who, you know, you can imagine how religious he is. But uh, every Monday morning in the newspapers, and uh, all the newspapers had front page photographs of Bill Clinton and church the day before, you know, singing songs and 
so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, the Bush people have pushed it to an extreme because, I mean, they're really harming the population, so they have to do something else to organize them. Uh, and uh, it's the same with everyone else. And they all have to uh, prove somehow that, uh, that they have to put their... They have to create characteristics which people may vote for. Well, th these are all uh, ways of undermining democracy. Uh, it's, just, you know, it's like trying to convince people to max out their credit cards on consumer goods that they don't want uh, or uh, pay attention to you know, can, can you trust him are all modes of preventing the threat of democracy from developing. And these are, you know, for obvious reasons, major industries. I mean, elite groups simply don't want the population to uh, become involved in uh, political and social affairs. It's much too dangerous. So again, asking whether the U.S. is becoming an oligarchy is just not the right question. Thank you very much.